We're here today with Mira Levinson, who's a professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and working on an exciting new project related to educational ethics. Mira, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Justin. Um, what is educational ethics and why do we need it? Educational ethics in some ways is a field that doesn't exist yet, but I am hoping will be as familiar and felt to be as necessary as, say, bioethics in 20 years. Um, it is aspirationally a uh, field that will provide practitioners uh, support, advice, um, ad uh, sort of mentorship, guidance, uh, as, as they face ethical challenges in their work, so teachers, principals, school board members, et cetera, um, as they are trying to figure out tough issues around equity, justice, transparency, democracy, merit, accountability, et cetera, um, it will bring the questions that we have about our principles and our values out of the shadows and m turn them into something that we can talk about honestly with one another. Also, I hope that educational ethics will be a field that can help policymakers. So right now, uh, policymakers will make policy around teacher hiring and firing decisions, around the Common Core, high stakes tests, changing graduation requirements, rules about uh, discipline with preschoolers. And after the fact, you will get people saying, well, that's terrible because it is inequitable, unjust, you know, that nobody's being held accountable, whatever. Um, in most other public policy fields, uh, say with bioethics being the example, um, you have people who think about the ethical uh, dimensions of policies coming in at the beginning. Uh, and so rather than people just throwing stones after the fact and people saying, oops, I did, hadn't thought about that, instead you can say, well, how are we going to re realize our values from the start? And then also educational ethics uh, is uh, a field in which we actually will develop theory that is relevant to these first two groups. Because right now, you know, there's a lot that people can say about Immanuel Kant or John Rawls or John Stuart Mill, um, but surprisingly little that we can say to teachers, superintendents, et cetera, about here's actually how you could make your own practice and your own work in your school or your district more ethical. So that's the other part of what it could be. And I think hopefully that's obvious why we need it. You taught in the Atlanta public schools. You taught in the Boston public schools. Were there sort of dilemmas that you encountered that partic in your teaching that particularly inspired you to think about the field of educational ethics? Like, are there particular dilemmas that you encountered in your teaching that, you know, sort of are anchors for you in thinking about why this is necessary? Yes, um, every single day. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one, I think that virtually every teacher faces is the dilemma around how to balance discipline uh, and learning, right? So, um, you know, I was not a bad disciplinarian, but I certainly had eighth graders who would prove challenging and who could be disruptive. And when they were being disruptive, what they were doing is that they were disrupting their own and other kids' learning, right? Uh, and so from a philosopher's perspective, what they're doing is they are reducing the distribution of education to themselves and all of these other kids. And that's bad, right? We want them to learn more. Um, at the same time, often the reason that they were disruptive was not because they wanted to be yelled at right? And not because they wanted to be perceived as a bad kid, but because they were nervous that they wouldn't be able to succeed at the material. And so they were trying to distract us from getting to the lesson where they would reveal their ignorance. Or because uh, they were really upset about something else. And the only way they knew how to express uh, the trauma that they were experiencing or something was through these disruptive actions. So it's not like they deserved punishment that would, say, lead them to being kicked out of the class and to lose learning, right? And that would make things worse in the long term. On the other hand, if they remain disruptive, then all kids were losing on learning, and these were kids who really needed to learn, right? All kids need to learn, right? And so um, that is, was a classic thing where always I was trying to think, 
What does this kid need and deserve? What do my other students need and deserve? And then on top of that, what are they going to learn about what other people in their community deserve based on the actions that I take, right? If I kick this kid out of my classroom, are they going to learn that some kids are expendable? Or are they going to learn maybe that their own needs and their own safety is really important, right? And you can't even figure that out necessarily because eighth graders won't necessarily tell you or their views about it will change or half the class will conclude one thing, half the class will conclude another. So that's one kind of example that I would really wrestle with. Another was um, we had lots and lots of policies that made sense on an aggregate scale right? But when it came to in the individual child or the individual classroom or the individual teacher, the aggregate reasoning either didn't quite apply or it would go wrong, right? Um, so uh, this tension, I think, that educators again, I think this is a really classic tension that we feel between we know the reason for the rule, we support the reason for the rule, we stand by this rule, and yet in this particular case, if we impose this rule, we can see that things are going to go worse rather than better, and we are going to violate our values and our principles. And how do we decide then whether and how much and how publicly to violate the rule versus to say, well, this is what the system as a whole requires. And that shows up uh, when you're thinking about everything from assigning a grade, letting a kid go on a field trip, uh, whether to let uh, kids chew gum in class, um, whether you're going to, in fact, impose silent lunch, uh, who you're going to promote or retain, um, you know, sort of at every level of the classroom teaching, I think that kind of dilemma arises pretty frequently. Who should who should get uh, sort of power or access to being able to make certain kinds of exceptions and then yes. who aren't? Um, in the discipline case in particular, you know, one of the things that it highlights is it just, um, on the one hand, the circumstance is kind of simple, like there's a kid who's acting out and you got to do something. Um, on the other hand, that simple scenario is connected to just this like really complex ecosystem of the particular kid that are in the room and the values bringing it bear. What's the consequence for this particular moment in class? What's the consequence for how my classroom or my school will function over the next few months? Um, how do you imagine sort of building a field that can help? It sounds like part, part of what you're trying to do is sort of constrain or put some boundaries or some patterns on that complexity so each individual circumstance doesn't feel like something amorphous that you have to figure out each time, but there are some, some patterns or strategies to be able to fall back on. Yeah, um, I think of the work that we're doing in part with teachers and school and district leaders as helping them build an ethical repertoire that is analogous to the pedagogical repertoire, say, you know, that many of us learn as teachers. Um, so the tool, the primary tool that we've been using uh, to help educators and policymakers develop this ethical repertoire are case studies. So. Uh, we have on our website, justiceinschools.org, um, and in a few books that we've published, a number of cases. They're pretty short. They're four or five pages. They're designed to be able to be read uh, by a native English speaker in about 10 minutes or less. So that then, you know, you can use them at the beginning of a 43-minute teacher meeting or a faculty meeting or a professional development workshop or whatever. Um, and it is through the discussion of these very concrete uh, cases uh, that we start to be able to develop um, a nuanced a account of the different kinds of considerations that are at stake. The, the normative considerations, meaning the considerations about values and principles. Also, some of the empirical considerations. What do we know about the effects of promoting or retaining a student? What do we know about the uh, impact of, say, putting kids into a peer learning situation, uh, putting a student into a timeout, sending them to the classroom next door with a worksheet, things like that, right? Um, 
that there's sort of accumulated research evidence about these things. So we don't just have to say like, well, it feels right to let someone go to the third grade or it feels right to make people repeat the third grade. We can say, okay, 40% of people who repeat the third grade have this consequence. And exactly. so that should be right. informing our decision making. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is actually a lot of good educational research out there and social science research out there. And we should be drawing on that. Right. Um, but then there's also the wisdom of practitioners. There's the wisdom of the, from the field. Too often, people who are coming at the work from outside education uh, see dichotomies, right? They think, well, you can do that. You can kick the kid out or not kick the kid out. And whereas the experienced teacher knows, oh no, you could partner the kid with the, you know, with Susanna, who will, who, who this kid loves, and you know, Susanna will keep him focused. Unfortunately, Susanna is going to find this really annoying, and so now I have to decide: Am I going to, you know, in rely inconvenience and annoy Susanna exactly in order to make for the, the sake, so so that David will then focus and learn. On the other hand, then we can all get, you know, move forward. Or I could put him in the next door teacher's classroom, and and all of these things have, you know, pluses and minuses to them. But that's where this ethical repertoire comes in, right? Uh, where I, over the time of talking through these cases with colleagues, actually with students, with parents, it's been fascinating to see what educators have been doing with them, um, including working on them with their middle schools and high school students. So, uh, they, so teachers take these case studies and they say, oh, let's have, let's, let's have these sort of teaching case studies be done by my students or be done by families in my schools to yes. see what these other stakeholders, how they respond to these Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. Um, and then through that work, you can start to develop some judgment. And it's not, I, I don't believe that we can ever know this is exactly what you should do, right? This is not, you know, a a rule book that tells you always first do X, then do Y, then do Z, right? Because it is always about the very particular circumstances in that minute. But you can at least say, well, you know, these things are off the table, right? <laughs> these things are actually unethical. They may be convenient. They may my, make my life a lot better. They may uh, fulfill the requirements that my principal is putting on me or the strictures that have been, you know, sent down by the school board, but actually, I cannot be complicit in that. This set of things uh, is within the realm of the possible. These things may be actually really good, and now I have a, a toolbox, an ethical toolbox, a pedagogical toolbox, uh, a, a toolbox from research that lets me now sort of hone my judgment so I'm not reasoning about everything from first principles, but I can engage in pattern recognition, and I can see, oh, okay, this is an issue of the individual uh, the needs of the individual versus c compared to the needs of the group. Or this is an instance of um, where we have a system creating uh, uh, patterns that then I'm trying to deal with as an as an individual teacher or or principal, and I can't do anything that feels fully ethical here because of how the system is organized. And I now know, you know, that that means I should not be trying to solve the problem in my own building or in my own district. Rather, I need to go and start working at the system level. So those are two examples of educational repertoires that you just proposed, sort of like balancing individual needs versus group needs and finding sort of scenarios in which there is no ethical option available to a teacher or a practitioner. And so the only option is to think about how you sort of change the entire system. Um, it's so not the only option because you still have to take you action. You still have to make some right? Yes, yep. right, right. So you, cho you may choose whatever you see as the least bad option, but you also in part so that you don't become Doris Santoro, uh, Doris Santoro has this beautiful book called Demoralized, where um, she writes about how often teachers are diagnosed as having burnt out. And she says, no, they haven't burned out. What they have become is demoralized. They cannot realize the moral rewards of teaching in the same way that they used to be able to. And so part of what you do, I think, in order not to become demoralized and to feel as if your work is immoral is you say, okay, I've done the least bad thing here, but I am not going to sit around and continue waiting for other uh, circumstances to come where I have to do bad stuff. I am also, yes, going to go up and try to make change at the system level. What are some of the most common scenarios in which people are, t in which teachers are stuck in these least bad option kinds of choices to have to make? <sighs> I'll offer two. 
One, I think, um, well, maybe I'll offer you a few and I'll let you decide which ones to pull out. Uh, so teachers who are teaching in schools and districts that have adopted zero tolerance policies, um, uh, which require that when a student has done something that violates a rule, there is a mandated... Disciplinary response. Yes, exactly. Uh, that is totally insensitive to circumstance, uh, to a kid's confusion, right, et cetera. Oftentimes, teachers find themselves uh, being required to impose punishments that they think rightly, that they rightly think are going to um, direct a kid's life permanently off course, right? Uh, that are going to lead to that kid being pushed into the penal system, right? Um, that are going to lead to the kid being expelled, uh, et cetera. Um, that's one circumstance, I think, in which, and there are smaller versions of that too. I, I, a number of teachers who work in really harsh, no excuses schools also find themselves, I think, often in that situation. Uh, a second, I think, is quite different, which is um, when you are in places of privilege and as an educator, you are trying to figure out if and when to stop certain kinds of, sort of uber privilege from working their way into um, your classroom or your school and distorting learning and growth, including into being good people. So um, for example, we actually have a case uh, uh, in our first book about grade inflation at um, a private day school where um, the teachers are feeling that they are being pushed, they are really being pressed by both parents and the administrators to inflate grades and that they cannot establish really rigorous expectations for students and they can't help their students learn and grow as much as they know they could because the kids are being given, you know, A's for pretty simple work, right? Um, and on the other hand, in teaching in this private school, they are in effect, the, the, the parents are contracting with them in part to help their kids get into highly selective and elite colleges, right? And there is ample social science evidence to show that uh, if you come from a school that grade inflates, you are going to have higher admission rates mm -hmm. uh, into selective institutions and then to jobs and so forth than if you come from places that have um, no grade inflation or even grade deflation, as Princeton University tried to do for about 10 years. And they finally gave up on it, right? Um, and so, uh, and if you deflate grades, you will in fact hurt your own students' chances of getting into the highly elite colleges that they will then succeed in if they get in, right? And so that question of how then do you serve a child's present day interest and also serve their future interest um, and, try, and try to work against the distorting effects of privilege but still serving the kids whom you love and care about, right, and should be serving. I think that's really hard, and that comes up not only in grades, it comes up uh, when you're looking at kids who are getting lots of tutoring and you think, no, I actually want you to have the experience of struggling with this, right? But because you're getting all of this extra support, you're not experiencing the struggle, and I worry about you, right? I worry that you may wilt later on, but I, how do I interfere, right? You know, with, I, I understand why you are getting these extra supports. It's a, a different kind of example, but I think oftentimes in highly privileged situations, we're also wrestling with um, 
no great option. And the uh, and again, all of it sort of boils down to you, uh, the vision I have in my head of is, is of a teacher hunched over a grade book with you know an assignment next to them, and they have to put some kind of mark down there. And really, you know, they're just choosing between an A and a B or an A and a minus and something like that. But all of these complex factors come into that tiny little decision. Um, and you know, after you've made that one decision for one student, you know, there's another 16 kids that you have to keep grading for. Um, and that seems like why having some of these ideas and principles would be helpful in helping people get through, you know, the, all, all the grading they have to do that week and then for the next marking period and, and Yeah, that's so on. right. And including uh, taking uh, that kind of judgment um, uh, outside, not having it be this private fraught thing where, right, yes, the teacher hunched over the grade book is very aware that they are making value-laden decisions. And right now, we have a culture that actively opposes the open discussion of those value-laden decisions, right? We can openly talk these days about pedagogical challenges we face in the classroom. How do you teach the distributive property? I'm really struggling with that. I hear that you made the War of 1812 interesting. Please tell me, tell how. me how, right? Um, and we can talk about classroom management questions. How on earth did you get Sally to you know, follow through on that project, right? And um, and we can talk about strategy, we can talk about leadership, right? There are a whole bunch of arenas of work in education that we have, I think, quite positively opened up for conversation. And we've tried to sort of peel back the black box, open up the classroom door, name some strategies and some dilemmas and so forth. But the ethical choices that we make, we haven't gotten anywhere on that. Instead, when people make moral claims in education, they are almost always uh, made from atop a mountain to throw down at the person who has you know, an, an opposing position uh, to say, clearly, you are immoral. Clearly, you have been captured by the teachers' unions. You are enthralled to the large corporate conglomerate of Pearson. You are racist. You don't care about kids. What right? You know, rather than saying, you know, when we make these choices, um, we most of us actually are quite motivated by values. We really are trying to do the right thing, but there are lots of complex considerations. And so, yes, if we can take it outside of the, the, the brain and the heart of the individual educator and make it a public conversation where then we have this conversation with our parents, with our administrators, with our colleagues, with our students saying, okay, so how should we think about grading here? Are we grading, are we giving, are we giving grades? as a chit, right, as something that you can then spend to get into Brown or Penn or Amherst or whatever? Are we using grades as a communicative tool about um, where you've uh, grown and where you still have to grow? Are we uh, using grades to signal actually how much effort we think that you've put in uh, and to motivate you to do more, right? Those are very different ways of thinking about the purposes of grades, they're all, sorry, uh, they're all perfectly, well, I don't know if they're perfectly legitimate, right? They all have some justification. Um, and yes, if we can bring that out of the shadows and into public conversation, then we may also lighten the burden of the teacher hunched over her grade book. When you get teachers and educators and you get them um, wrestling with these case studies, if you've, if you've got 10 or 15 people in the room, do you find that most case studies, communities of people gravitate towards some kind of answers and you're trying to have to propose to them alternatives or just like every possible alternative usually show up in the room with any group of people? Um, as they talk about them, do they develop consensus afterwards or do people leave going, oh yeah, I still don't know what I would do? Um, Ideally, people leave saying, at the very least, I understand why others may make a different decision than I would. Oftentimes, they do leave saying, I still don't know what I would do. So we have one of the cases that we've been using in the last uh, year or two has been um, around 
uh, a school culture committee meeting. So this is a K-8 to school um, that uh, immediately after uh, President Trump's election um, has become riven. Um, so uh, the pro-Trump students are a minority in the school and they are feeling ostracized uh, by the anti-Trump students. Uh, at the same time, some of the reasons that they are ostracizing them or, uh, are because the anti-Trump students are actually feeling um, insulted by uh, the pro-Trump students. So there's a friendship that uh, actually falls apart because um, uh, Daniela uh, talks about criminal illegals. Uh, to her friend uh, Maria uh, and Maria's like you know the status of my cousin right you know that I have an undocumented cousin why are you going to talk about criminal illegals the case centers uh, then actually on a first grade classroom where you have a set of boys who are building a wall out of blocks and when the first grade teacher asks them so you know tell me about this thing that you're building out of blocks they say oh we're building the wall we're building the wall and she says oh why to keep the Mexicans out and then the teacher is like, <gasps> like, you know, I, and she looks around her classroom and she sees some of her other kids are like, you know, listening. What, what is she going to say and do? And she talks about how at first, you know, how her normal approach is to let kids play things out on their own, right? She does not believe in intervening. And on the other hand, she believes in having an equitable and inclusive classroom. And so she thinks, well, should I just redirect them like to the paints, right? And we can just like pretend that none of this has happened. Then she thinks, no, 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 I'm their teacher, right? I need to, uh, she decides they don't know what they're saying. I need to teach them uh, to think more inclusively. So she asks them, so why, uh, you know, why do you think people want to keep others out? And they talk and eventually one kid says, well, to take our, because they may take our jobs. And so she says, well, so what are your jobs? And they discuss that their jobs are to be kind and caring and respectful and to learn. Can anyone take that job away from you? And the kids are like, no. And she's like, great, right? And I have now, you know, brought back my inclusive classroom and taught them good values. But as she recounts this story in the school culture committee meeting, uh, one of the parents in the room uh, says, do you realize that you had kids, first graders, who were really aware about public policy about uh, what's going on politically, right? They are doing something actually in line with the policies of the President of, of the United States. And probably had those policies been coming out of, say, President Obama, you would have celebrated their civic knowledge and their engagement and so forth. And he, instead, because you disagree with our president, you shut that down. And that is actually a partisan move that you should not be making as a first grade teacher. And so then they go back and forth about this, right? We have never had, sorry, every group that we have leaves continuing to talk about the case and continuing to, to wrestle with it. And ideally in the work that we do with cases, what we do is expand people's um, understanding of the values uh, at, and ethical considerations at work, while also giving them tools to say, OK, I understand that I'm not going to make everybody happy here, right? But here are some approaches that we have to move forward. I will say there's some other parts of our work that where we are trying to identify just patently unethical practices in education and to try to stop them. So for example, we have a paper that we've written about lunch shaming. Uh, and you may know, a couple of years ago, New Mexico is the first state in the nation to pass a law banning lunch shaming, which is shaming children for being in arrears over their lunch money. And so the, making them wear a special, wear a special bracelet shirt or get different or bracelet, food get, right, or be given a cold cheese sandwich. Having, line. Yes, yeah. exactly. Having their hot lunch um, yeah, thrown out in front of them, having a stamp on their hand, I owe money. But that is just clearly unethical. We should not be doing that. And so we've been doing, we did a huge huge amount of research. Uh, one of my students, Henry Atkins, like, did amazing work where he just looked into uh, how much money is owed. You may know that Philando Castile's wife uh, has donated money from his foundation the last two years to pay off the um, lunch money to the Minneapolis public schools that are owed by kids so that the seniors can graduate, right? I mean, it's kind of crazy that we need to do this. So 
lunch shaming is one example of, I think, an unethical practice. Um, criminalizing truancy is another example of an unethical practice. So there are some things that we just need to learn we should not be doing. And ideally, if this project is successful, it will no longer happen in any school or district in the country in, say, a decade or two. Other things, though, are much harder. And uh, that's where the casework has been coming in. Where does educational ethics sort of intersect with classroom pedagogy, with teaching practices, with the, 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 the kinds of, is there, is there, you describe that there's a pedagogical repertoire and an ethical repertoire. Like, where do you see the overlap between those things? That's a great question. So in some ways, and this is why I was talking about wisdom from the field, um, we may misperceive a decision as being an ethical dilemma when if we actually have a large enough pedagogical repertoire, it's just not. So for example, when you ask a question in class, you know, kids' hands will shoot up, right? Uh, some kids' hands. And uh, when I taught, you know, uh, me methods classes, when you and I taught methods classes together, right? One of the things that I would always teach students is, well, if the hand shoots up as soon as you ask the question, it means that the kid knew the answer, right? Before, like they're not actually learning anything, <laughs> right? And so you need to wait at least as long, uh, at least long enough for the kids who are in the process of learning, right? To think through the answer and raise their hand. Also, there are just differences in cognitive processing time, right, that people need. And so, you know, we teach novice teachers about wait time, about saying in their uh, head silently, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then calling on students, right? And by then, um, hopefully, you will have a much broader array of hands in front of you, and you can call on the student who has been less engaged, who has been less sure of themselves, who you think will give an interesting answer, who may give the, a wrong answer, but you bet is something that will reflect the misconceptions of a bunch of other kids in the room. And so then you guys can work it out together and, and help a lot of kids solve their problems rather than the kid who has the right answer, who, which is not going to address any of the other kids' confusions, et cetera. And so there, it may appear that you had an ethical dilemma about, you know, do you keep calling on the same kid over and over and answer the, or answer the question yourself or whatever, but you don't because if you simply wait, you will get more equitable and inclusive participation and you can make more choices. But um, there are often times when it's not that simple, right? Uh, and, you know, you really do have this question of, well, I have this set of kids who have really mastered the material and they are ready to go on. I have this other set of kids who are really still struggling. And they're uh, partly, again, having a pedagogical repertoire really helps. So you think, okay, should I give a quick mini lesson? and then let the kids go on, right? Should I do some uh, peer, some partnering? And so I can take some of the kind of struggling kids and some of the kids who get it, and they can work on an extension activity that might challenge the, um, the kid who has it, but help give extra practice, right, to the kid who's still struggling? Should I do a pullout, right? You know, there are lots of things that pedagogically, if you have a good pedagogical repertoire, you can do to think about this, but also then it can intersect with the ethical repertoire as you think, okay, um, to whom, you know, do I owe more right now, right? How do I think about um, the, the layout of needs here? about what it means to act equitably here, right? Am I striving, in fact, to help every kid learn the same amount? Am I striving to lift up the least advantage so that they have, you know, are at some floor? Am I trying to create high ceiling opportunities because I believe that equity is actually in some ways right now paired with excellence, right? These are really different ways of thinking then about to whom you owe your work. And then also this question of, um, and how do I think about, say, if it going back to the peer, uh, the partnering, right? Um, it's not just me, right, who has learning to distribute uh, and to gain. It's the 
students themselves and how do I think also then about teaching them about the kind of community we want to create and the kinds of responsibilities and rights they have as learners and as students within the classroom in relationship to one another. And so if you have this set of this sort of ethical repertoire at work, again, it doesn't mean that you automatically know what to do, but in partnership with the pedagogical repertoire, it may give you a couple of pretty clear pathways to go down. So it sounds like in combining, in thinking about pedagogical strategies and ethical considerations that as teachers develop a richer pedagogical repertoire, it becomes a little bit easier to distribute resources between the needs of the individual and the needs of the group. Because if you have good teaching strategies that can attend to both simultaneously, then then those ethical dilemmas become a little bit less fierce or, or, or the distribution becomes a little easier. That's right. Yes. It doesn't resolve them, but it definitely helps. It makes them na- good. It, it, the way that you describe these dilemmas as sort of along a spectrum or a space or something mm-hmm. like that. It sounds like we're, that part of what we can keep doing here is sort of trying to make the space smaller and smaller so that more and more good good decisions that feel better fit within the space and we know more about like, okay, those, you know, those teaching strategies are going to make me have to make harder ethical decisions, so I'm going to stay away from those, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's an excellent account. We talked about a couple of um, classroom and school-based case studies. What have been some of the case studies that you've had policymakers work on, people who are thinking about whole educational systems? Uh, So one of the case studies that I was really pleased actually has been used with lawmakers and journalists in the Massachusetts State House um, uh, is a case study we did about charter school expansion. So... um, I'm really interested in how we talk about um, high achieving charter schools, right? First of all, I actually find it annoying that we tend not to talk about high achieving uh, public schools in the same, or, you know, uh, district, regular district public schools, as charters are also public schools. Um, uh, But more to the point, so I'm, in Massachusetts a few years ago, we were, uh, there was a law that was being debated, right? There was proposed legislation um, around charter school expansion and what kinds of criteria charter schools needed to meet in order to be allowed to open up a second or a third or a fourth campus. Uh, and many of these criteria made sense. These criteria made sense on their face. For example, that um, the school could not have an attrition rate that was substantially worse than the attrition rate of the surrounding district. However, they, they can't like get higher achievement scores by having lots by, of kids who get pushed out exactly. in the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. So there's ten kids who are graduating. Precisely. In the grade or yes. Like exactly. Um, However, when we looked, so we decided, all right, we're going to take one specific charter school in Boston, the Academy of the Pacific Rim, and compare it to the Boston Public Schools and think about, you know, it's not that Academy of the Pacific Rim was proposing to expand. We were just kind of interested in the school because it's a school that a lot of people actually quite like, but it's not, uh, and it's not like a... um, a rallying cry, you know, it's just a good individual charter school that, you know, has some kids do some interesting things. And so we thought, okay, well, they have actually very good uh, MCAS scores, the state um, testing, uh, testing. uh, yes, exactly. Uh, And they have good SAT scores, actually better than the state average. And Massachusetts is one of the best states in the country. Um, If it were its own country, it would be on a par with Shanghai, China, with Singapore, right? It would be one of the best countries in the world, right? Uh, And so that seems really good. On the other hand, Academy of the Pacific Rim does lose a bunch of their kids, about 60 to 65 percent. And so we thought, all right, well, if we look at the Boston Public Schools and we looked at presumably the top, say, 45 or 40 percent of kids, well, they'd also have really good MCAS scores and SAT scores. So we thought, well, maybe we can't actually compare them that way. But then you look at the Academy of the Pacific Rim and where their kids are going, and the data are not specific enough to be able to show us exactly right when they have kids who attrit, who leave, where, where they go to. But a bunch of them quite clearly go to 
selective private schools in the area and to one of the exam schools in uh, Boston. So Boston has three ex uh, schools that you have to take an exam to get into and they are highly competitive and they are uh, you know highly admired and a bunch of kids will leave Academy of the Pacific Rim to go there. Now that doesn't count as attrition for the Boston Public Schools if you move on from a Boston Public Middle School into Boston Latin School, you're not leaving the district. But if you leave Academy of the Pacific Rim to go to BLS, you are. And so then you think, well, then it's not clear that we should count those attrition rates against them, right? So as you start uh, sort of peeling back the onion of the data, you think, you start to think, I don't know if it's even possible to compare this charter with this district. Uh, in terms of quality. And on the other hand, in some ways we need to, right, in order to make good public policy decisions about how we're going to spend public monies. Um, and so that's an example of a policy-oriented case uh, that, um, again, we heard actually from uh, sitting legislators, uh, was really useful to them to uh, sort of take the pro-charter versus anti-charter divide out of the picture and say, let's agree that we all care about helping all children achieve a high-quality education. Um, now, there are some normative differences about th what that means, and right again, you know, if all children can't, which are the children we should focus on, et cetera. But like taking that as a given, now let's see what can we agree on also about how we think about uh, assessing charters and districts. Gee, this is really hard. And that's actually where our work is and where some of our disagreements are. It's not because we are ideologically fixed into the pro charter versus anti charter camps. It's actually that we all care about expanding educational opportunities for kids, but depending on which numbers we focus on or, you know, how many layers of the onion that we peel back, uh, we may all agree then on how we interpret the data and whether that data is relevant, and then we don't know what to do, right, because it just depends on how many layers we're going to peel back. And that's where we should really be having these public democratic conversations uh, rather than these, you know, large ideological camps. We also have a, a really interesting case that has become in ways quite hot uh, just now because of all of the stuff that's coming out about like automated um, facial recognition, right? You know, ICE, say, using uh, driver's licenses, uh, including from our state of Massachusetts, to do automated facial recognition to try to identify undocumented residents and so forth. So we have a case uh, about um, the ways in which schools and districts are basically able to spy on our kids uh, by doing automated content analysis of what they put on Google Classroom, uh, by scanning what they do on social media if they have used their school provided email address to sign up for Insta or Snap or whatever, by looking at anything, including keystroke analysis, anything they do on a school provided uh, device like an iPad or a Chromebook. And the schools are doing this and the districts are doing this in part because they are required by state law in every single state to to combat cyberbullying. This was a federal initiative a few years ago. And um, they are also doing it to try to identify and stop school shooters. And they're doing it in order to try to um, intervene with students who are struggling with mental health issues, with um, eating disorders, at risk of suicide, uh, who are perpetrating or uh, victims of bullying, whether it's cyberbullying or uh, sort of in-person bullying. And all of that seems really important to keep our kids safe. And on the other hand, the degree of knowledge that um, schools and public officials and non-public officials like the IT guy, right, down at the central office has about our children, including uh, there's a software company called Gaggle that did a single study of just like if you scoop up 25 million uh, student records on a, in a single hour, it found 154,000 reportable offenses, mostly because kids are using their school provided device or email to sign up for Insta and then they are, uh, or Snap or whatever, and then they're sending each other nudies, right? And so you have these IT directors who can see 
all of these kids nudie pictures, right? Which you don't want, right? Yeah. And you also don't want 154,000 kids being classified as sex offenders, or right? And so I think there are these real questions as well as questions about civil li liberties. There's very clear evidence that uh, kids of color that Muslim kids, et cetera, are uh, likely to be disproportionately targeted, that kids who are white supremacists, et cetera, are disproportionately likely to be ignored. Uh, so I think that's another really interesting um, policy question about how we use technology to protect our most vulnerable people, our children, while also helping them uh, come to understand their rights and responsibilities as citizens and as people and to develop in you know healthy ways, which includes for many kids when you're 14 and 15 and 16 years old, doing things that you don't want your uh, IT guy to know IT about. IT guy to know about. Or to be right. permanently recorded and, exactly. and all those other kinds of things. And, you know, yeah, it sounds like another short-term thing about we can protect student we can protect students from individual acts of harm if we subject them to a surveillance culture um, that will, you know, prepare them for a lifetime of corporate and government surveillance that we, like, teach them all kinds of books, you know, 1984 and things like that in school that, you know, yep. or, or Brazil or... Right. Um, and some, of, actually, some of the arguments in favor of socializing kids into the surveillance culture is that once they're employees, that same surveillance culture is going to, in fact, apply to them because their employer has the right to examine every keystroke on their employer-provided laptop, et cetera. And so they might as well get used to it now and come to understand what the consequences are. Good, yeah, because, are. because a purpose of our public schools is to prepare people for employment in the, in the world. Yeah, what do we do when employment becomes dystopian? And do you want schools to prepare people to resist that or to prepare people to be accommodated to it? Okay. Um, so when teachers, when school leaders, when uh, legislatures take these case studies and bring them back to their workplace and do them without you on their own, um, what advice do you have for folks about using them in terms of setting them up and facilitating and debriefing? What are kind of the top tips for making these useful for other people? So on our website, justiceinschools.org, where we have about 20 or 25 of these cases right now, we have a pretty generic protocol that you can also just download on the website that is um, generic but effective, right? Um, and so the first question is always, what are the dilemmas in this case for whom and why? Uh, and one thing that I suggest is that you spend time on that. Don't move on too quickly. Um, there will always be a couple of really obvious dilemmas that you need to encourage people to articulate because they'll feel as if they're sort of being goody two-shoes if they say, well, the dilemma is do you turn in the kid who stole the cell phone if you know that they're going to then end up facing a felony charge, right? And um, but that's an important one, right? <laughs> uh, but then you, as you go longer uh, and you spend more time, and again, wait time is crucial, right? It's fine to have people sitting in silence thinking. Then more dilemmas come out. Should she have taken a job at this school in the first place? Um, how, you know, dilemma for the other students. How should they respond if they know what this kid did and doesn't, you know, tell the dilemma for the call. You know, right, things can start um, unspooling, and that's where a lot of the work is in starting to get the richness. So one thing is use the protocol that's on the website and give yourself time with the first few questions. S second is uh, to create a norm in which um, it's okay okay even expected that one will disagree. It's okay and even expected that one will change one's mind. And to reinforce the idea that these cases have been intentionally created to be as hard as possible, right? So when we uh, develop them, we will usually edit them 12 or 13 or 15 times. We finally think, okay, we think this is ready to field test. We field test it with at least two quite diverse groups. Um, and then we usually make changes. And we especially make changes if 
uh, a group has managed to solve the case, right? Um, and they say, well, you know, just bring in a special education teacher or, well, just, you know, assign more money, open summer school. And often these are what I call magic fairy dust solutions, right? You know, you wave your magic wand and suddenly the situation has actually changed and then you don't feel face the ethical dilemma. So one of the things that we do there is we try to uh, help explain either why waving the magic uh, wand wouldn't work or stop people from trying to wave the magic wand. So for example, in the case that we have about the stolen cell phone and a no excuses school, what everybody originally wanted to talk about is why no excuses schools are bad, right? And why you shouldn't have, or not no excuses, sorry, zero tolerance. So we have this case about, you know, this kid who steals a cell phone in a zero tolerance setting and that a teacher is obligated by contract to report the theft. And it is quite clear because the kid is 17 that he will face felony charges as an adult and that this has, um, uh, and face jail time of up to five years, right? And so, it, the, it used to be that when we field tested it, people would say, well, clearly zero tolerance is immoral. And I would say, yes, but she's teaching in the zero tolerance school. So what do we do about that? And there's a no, zero tolerance is bad. We think, but there are thousands of teachers who are teaching in zero tolerance schools and districts right now, right? And what should they do? Should they just quit their jobs? So we we actually changed the case uh, to create a quite sympathetic character um, who had good reasons for enforcing zero tolerance. Uh, doesn't mean that we were trying to convince people that zero tolerance was good, but through introducing this character, it made them say, okay, I can understand why you might choose to teach in a zero tolerance school. We can still think that it would be better if zero tolerance didn't exist, but now we will focus in on the dilemma that this teacher and her colleagues and so forth face. Um, so, we then, once we make the revisions, we field test again, and we keep doing that until we have tested it with multiple groups who basically leave saying, this is really hard. So my second piece of advice is normalize the difficulty and say that this is part of the point of our work together, is to admit that we face ethically challenging choices here and to build a culture of conversation around the ethical dilemmas and to be open with one another. A third tip is to say that um, we need to be open to listening to others' articulations of values. We disagree with one another about what to do uh, in a certain classroom or in policy or whatever, sometimes because we agree on what the value is, but we disagree on how to interpret the value, right? So we both agree that we believe in equity, but uh, you believe in equity with an orientation towards resources. I you know, believe in equity with an orientation towards outcomes. She, you know, believes in equity with an orientation toward opportunities. And actually resources, opportunities, and outcomes are three different things, right? And so we can all believe in equity, but it turns out that we disagree. In other cases, uh, we may um, both embrace a set of values but rank order them differently, right? So we both agree that equity is important, that fairness is important, and that accountability is important. But you rate equity more you know, over accountability, and I rate accountability over equity, right? And so we disagree with one another. In other cases, it may just be that we disagree about what values matter, right? And so you're like, accountability? Really, that, you know, who cares about accountability? Really, I, you know, care about X. And I'm like, no, 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 accountability is, you know. So um, understanding whether we actually have different values that are leading us to go in different directions. If we have the same values, but we weight them differently, or if we have the same values, but we are interpreting them differently, or even we interpreting them the same, but we see their application to this particular case differently, right? So we both agree that opportunity 
is super important. But you are oriented toward the opportunity, you know, to learn. And I am oriented, you know, sort of learn academics. And I'm thinking, no, it's about the opportunity to grow as a person or right, whatever it is. And or no, you know, you think that by helping Philip, you're expanding opportunity. I actually think that by helping Kate, we're expanding and, you know, equalizing opportunity. Uh, and we say, well, no, but, you know, right. And we start talking about Philip versus Kate. That actually is really helpful because then when we are interacting with colleagues, with parents, with, you know, our school board, whatever, uh, with our students, uh, and they question our judgment or we question their judgment, we can start to see one another as ethically driven people who do care about doing the right thing. And we can start to name, oh, okay, I can understand that you think that this value is really important. I'm actually more oriented toward this other value. Or yes, I agree. We both really do care about uh, fairness and transparency. But I see that as playing out in a different way. And we can start to work with one another more as human beings. So I guess that's my third tip is to really listen hard to one another and give one another space to work ideas out in real time as a po and model that also for others model uncertainty because if you say if you're the facilitator that opens up opportunities for others to also venture into uncertainty as opposed to feeling as if they have to uh, demonstrate that they are knowledgeable or you know uh, that they know the right thing to do um, and that when you can get into a position of uncertainty together, that's often where the most learning happens, just as in our classrooms. It's when students are mucking about in a space in which they're really unsure. Wait, if we move that variable there, will that be the same expression? Or wait, if the atom bomb hadn't been dropped at that time, would you know, the Americans have won the war anyway, right? That's the point where often you have high engagement and high learning. And I think that's true for us as adults as well. Do you have concerns with any of this work that pushing people into having, you know, the, the, the hardest possible case studies, the hardest possible scenarios, taking decisions which maybe people had thought were simple and making them more and more complex that some of this could be discouraging um, or, or, or have you or have you gotten that response or feedback from other folks like what is what is it that will that that will make people um, feel I mean it seems, it seems like part of the work an important part of the work is to make people feel like, yeah, this is these are doable and solvable in some kind of way. Do you worry about making you know every dilemma seem somewhat intractable? Right, that's a great question. Um, yes and no. So one of the really important pieces of the protocol is that after you spend time really thinking hard about who the what the dilemmas are for whom and why and you spend time thinking really hard about are th these um, disagreements over values or interpretations or applications of values, are, are there questions around the social science, around, uh, you know, sort of pragmatic judgment, et cetera. It's always, and so who should do what and why, right? And a recognition that people have to take action. You can't just sit in the uncertainty forever. A kid's got to be assigned a grade. You have to decide whether or not to report. You've yes, to right. You've to retain a student. There's yep. no, the teacher always, it boils down to a decision. Yes, it does. Um, right. And even if you say, okay, I'm also going to fight the system, on top of that, you have to decide what do you say to these, you know, kids who are building the block wall or whatever, right, at, in that moment. Um, so I think this is less discouraging than it might be because it provides pathways for action and an affirmation that uh, as an educator, you must take action. Um, but that also, even if you don't feel great about the action that you're going to take at this moment, there are other times, right? You'll get to, you know, uh, again, for better or worse, we're always going to be facing ethical dilemmas in our work. And so we can take different actions at other times and ideally get better at it. So that's one reason I don't think it's totally demoralizing or, or dis even discouraging. A second thing is the work that we do 
with educators and with parents and with policymakers, they always recognize these dilemmas as reflecting ones that they themselves have faced. These feel real and They feel real and authentic and like, oh yes, let me tell you about my Kate. Let me tell you, right, you know. Um, and so it does not feel to people as if we are actually complicating questions that they felt were easy. It feels to them as if we are naming uh, and bringing to the surface uh, dilemmas and challenges that they often couldn't quite name and describe and that they felt that they had to keep submerged and to deal with privately. And so often that's actually a relief to them um, as opposed to something discouraging. And again, if you can develop a repertoire, if you get a set of heuristics, um, that can be quite empowering, right? And I would say that the third thing is it is discouraging for people who are looking for a list of best practices, right? Um, And so in fact, I've learned in my course to um, be really clear with students that this is not a class about how to be a more ethical educator, at least not directly, right? I am not going to teach you the 10 Lamavian steps so that, you know, you know that you are now an ethical educator when you walk into your classroom next year. Instead, I am going to help you develop ethical judgment and I'm going to help you uh, master a set of tools and knowledge and dispositions that you can take into your work in schools, um, uh, with parents, et cetera, to facilitate uh, ethical dialogue and reflection with others so that you collectively become a more ethical organization, but not because you have learned here are, you know, the five steps to being a more ethical organization, but because you have the tools to um, discuss together about how you are going to exercise collective judgment to do better rather than worse work with kids. Um, And so for those people who already recognize the messiness and already uh, embrace the idea that when we work in and with schools and children and families and communities, that it is about an exercise of judgment as opposed to a mastery of really discrete moves, Again, this feels empowering rather than discouraging. For others who really just want to be told what to do, yes, this can be very discouraging because I do not tell people what to do. Yeah, but I think most of the educators um, who are working in schools, you know, certainly the ones making a lifelong commitment to this, like you get into it because you're excited about messy relationships with kids, messy content, these kinds of decisions. And it does seem to me that just being able to say, here's a thing that we were all thinking about by ourselves, but now we can think about it together and now we can have a shared language would be something that would be really helpful for lots of schools. Well, Mira, thanks for coming in today and chatting with us about educational ethics. And it'll be really fun to watch this work develop in the years ahead. Thanks for the invitation, Justin. This was really fun.